Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to Thought of Web Magazine Live. Uh, for those of you who don't know me yet, I am Ramya Mariela Lagami. I'm the editor in chief of Thought of Web Magazine, which is a publication for family businesses and entrepreneurs. And so we're really excited about this live session today for a little bit of context for those of you who uh, don't know anything about our magazine. For the last 13 years, we've been building this publication to bring stories and insights to family business owners who want to make their companies and their wealth last for generations to come. And uh, we've been super honored in featuring hundreds of families in our magazine and telling their stories, but as well have been really um, lucky in the types of experts and academics we've been able to feature on the magazine that have shared their insights and shared their research. Uh, so all in all, a beautiful collection of original content that you can find on our website. We'll be sharing a few links today in the chat as well. And um, it's it's going to be, just be a really great new format that we're engaging in here today, which is called Thorough World Magazine Live, where we invite family business owners and experts to share their knowledge with our community directly, because maybe some of you uh, feel the need to ask questions that I don't think of asking or that we don't think of asking and we want to give you that opportunity. So we encourage you all to engage uh, during this session uh, with myself, but mostly of course with our guest of honor today. Uh, I'm being joined today by Peter English. Uh, Peter English was the global family business and EMEA private business leader, PwC Germany. Welcome Peter to Thought of Magazine Live. Yeah, thanks for having me here, Ramya. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you so much. And we're we're actually going to really dive straight into this, Peter, you and I, because we have a very, very important topic to discuss today, a topic that I know is very close to your heart, as it is to mine. We're going to be talking about ESG and sustainability practices of family businesses globally. And so the exciting part of us starting out this conversation, particularly with you, is that you have data and you have data which is which uh, comes from the recent uh, PwC's recent global family business survey in fact your 10th global family business survey and it's it's fascinating to read and we we will also be adding a link to um, to the survey in the chat for those of you who want to go check it out Let's start with the data, uh, Peter, because I think the data is going to bust a few myths maybe on, on what we think about uh, the connection between ESG and sustainability agendas in family businesses. What did you find out during the survey when it comes to the ESG agendas of family enterprises? Yeah, many thanks, Ramya. So um, as you mentioned, so we are conducting our family business every, uh, every second year, and it was in fact the 10th family business survey that we PwC conducted globally. And this time we were interested in a couple of focus areas and especially also with one focus area on ESG and sustainability. Um, we had uh, more than 3000 respondents from all parts of the world, which uh, makes our survey really robust and also statistically relevant, but uh, also the demographics are uh, has been really striking. So many of uh, also multi-generational family businesses have attended. So let me start with a couple of good news. Uh, first of all, so you may wondering how have family business uh, uh, dealt with the crisis? How has they survived uh, the crisis and what is the outlook going forward? So one of the striking um, findings is that family business, according to the nature and we know as a GDP, a job creator, they remain to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. In fact, 86% predict growth, many or even double-digit growth in 2022. This is a very positive good news. During the crisis, they have been able to prove they're resilient. It was always a hypothesis that family business are more resilient than their corporate peers. And in fact, 79% did not need additional capital funding during the pandemic. And only 34% had to cut dividends. So the shareholders stand really united and were able to manage the crisis uh, really well. When it comes to sustainability, 55% want to lead on sustainability 
and fully recognize their responsibility. So it's all good news so far. Yeah. But but now comes the but. I, <laughs> I was, I was but. waiting yeah. for it. It was yeah. a really yeah, yeah. positive there, preamble. So there always has to be a downside. <laughs> there, there, there is going to be a I can feel a big one coming. So here we go. <laughs> yeah. So I want to start with the good news first. Very right? nice. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, the downside is really that only 37% have a sustainability strategy in place. And only a minority uh, list sustainability as one of their business priorities. And this was a little bit of a shocking finding for me, uh, because I have assumed that this number is much higher. And in fact, um, as trust is the basis for sustaining legacy family business, I'm wondering whether not having a strong focus on ESG goals may result in a situation that you put your license to operate at risk. And if this happens, mm. this will become a major issue because currently we see that the corporates of the world, even BlackRock and others, uh, putting themselves in a position as an ESG sustainability promoter. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a big finding in our service in our survey as well. So even if family businesses, of course, are pool positioned because they are here to stay for the long term, they don't have to uh, report on a quarterly basis and they do not face short term market pressure. Even if they have this potential to lead on sustainability, this is not the case. Even mm -hmm. if many of the leaders said, yes, we want to adopt this role. We understand our responsibility, but there's little action. And this is why we said there's a gap to close. Yeah, and the time to act is now. But I mean, it, it, isn't it just so strange though? Because like, I think that we all somehow automatically assume that sustainability would be a priority, like ESG would be a priority because family businesses operate under the ambition of multi-generational uh, of multi-generational success so it should shouldn't it really come very naturally that this is part of the conversation or do you think that maybe there is a sense of does this actually touch our responsibilities is this actually part of what we need to be taking care of if we already are trying to take care of transmitting the business to the next generation is there maybe a, a different prioritization so this is a very interesting question. And in fact, we could also see, according to our figures and numbers, that there's also regional differences. Right? You see, for instance, a big, uh, big gap between those cultural backgrounds where you have a more collective norm versus mm -hmm. the individualistic societies like in Western Europe and in the Anglo-Saxon environment, where historically it was always the assumption that profit and purpose go not well along with each other. Yeah, and this is why in many cases, and you know all the big foundations from Rockefeller and all the other big well-known ones, there's always a hypothesis and the assumption that we could, could again prove in our service in 2021 that in the Anglo-Saxon and European environment, there's a strong belief you earn the money with your business and you give back through philanthropy mm -hmm. as a family on a voluntary basis. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Asia, in the more collectivistic uh, uh, um, cultural norms so and with the new entrepreneurs arising uh, and family businesses arising in asia we see that in this cultural context sustainability and esg has been from the beginning embedded into the business values and in the business priorities so it's it's from my point of view interesting to see that 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 those countries with a longer family business history mm -hmm. had a different culture of giving back uh, than the newcomers. So it's a new emerging market where family business in many cases, not in all cases, we know that Japan is the host of the oldest family business overall, but let's say the emerging economies in Asia uh, believe that sustainability has to be a part and in the center of the of the of the business strategy and business ethics mm -hmm. from the beginning and i think this is a fundamental difference the question is what is the next step what is the, what yeah. you make out of this situation so so far it's just a finding the interesting part is today to 
look at the findings that you have from the survey and then look at the recent uh, Throw Up Magazine collection we have published on sustainable legacies, where we have in fact documented the uh, sustainability and ESG strategies of five family businesses. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a really inspiring collection. We encourage you to have a look at the link here under the, uh, in the comments section. The collection spans uh, several so several continents basically we have cases from mexico the philippines two from the us and a case from yemen so really a very widespread uh, cultural panel here as well and, and sort of like a very interesting very diverse uh very diverse uh palette of families that clearly have found a way to uh make it uh, make esg a priority of families who've clearly found a way to operate uh at i would what i think in a uh, is an exemplary fashion uh, in harmony with uh, you know the environment and and uh, and the social uh, and the social impact that they're having. I would love to just quote uh, one of the interviewees from the HSA group, one of uh, the largest uh, family business from Yemen, but also a global enterprise by now in the, in the fourth generation, a beautiful family business. And the interviewee, uh, Mr. Nabil Hayr Said Anam, said, "If you want sustainability." You have to look at your employees. You have to look at the society that you are working in. You have to look at the customers that you're serving, what you're providing, because that will continue for generations to come. And when you embed these values into the business, into the family business, this success will continue. And such a simple piece of wisdom, but it's a very, uh, I think the, the the common denominator as well of those five families that we looked at is that they all approached it in a very simple fashion they all had a very pragmatic way of uh, implementing sort of sustainable business models and and focusing on an esg agenda but you look at the survey results peter and you look at the stories that that we, that we featured in the collection what do you think about the families that you see there in this collection so what of what strikes you about them and what what does each one of them maybe exemplify that you feel you would want to see more of in that case in the family business community? Now let me state, uh, start with uh, HSA Group uh, that you quoted uh, now at the beginning uh, of uh, of the conversation here. I think what is really striking and stunning is that the the strong element, the strong belief of giving back, the strong belief of taking care of others, this is more important than focus only on profitability and money. Mm -hmm. This was a founder's belief mm -hmm. when the business has started 85 years ago. Mm -hmm. And at that time, a concept of ESG or sustainability, of course, didn't exist. It was about profitability, making money. And uh, so people at that time, also in the second generation, did not really uh, understood why the owning family always put money aside from the profits. And mm. when I read the story, right, and they said, you know, they, in the evening they were counting the money and the profit and like the calculation. And every day they set money aside to give it back to those who yeah. needed it the most. And today we can understand this better in the concept of sustainability for so the long term. Today, uh, where we know that, it, uh, that it's so important to attract and retain the best talent. Today, where we better understand the concept of trust as a business factor, this concept is, uh, has become now, now state of the art as a kind of a leading practice. But it was always at the core of the family values of the HSA group. And this is what I find so striking in this story, that they started with a strong belief, we are not here only for us as a family to be a good and healthy family and to pass on wealth and ownership to the next generation. We are also here to make the planet and the society a better place. So mm -hmm. um, I remember, so uh, in your article, Nabil was also saying, so. So what, what has been the question? Do they exist only to make money? Do they want to make a mm -hmm. difference on people's lives? And yes, as a private business, they wanted to make money, but they also, and they want to grow and to innovate, but also they want to have a positive impact on the people of others. 
And this is what I find very striking because this is not something that that they have responded to based on external pressure. So this is exactly what we see with the corporates right now. Yeah. So 10 years ago, I mean, the yeah. concept of shareholder value was a dominating concept. Yeah. Profit mm. for the shareholder means everything. And today it's 180% uh, U-turn. Yeah. And mm. say, wow, today ESG on the top of the agenda. And then Larry thinks that uh, climate risk is investment risk. So this has really changed the game, but it was always at the heart of AS. The HSA family. And this was really striking for me. And despite the fact that they had to operate in very difficult circumstances. Exactly. The, I mean, they were put to the test. Yemen, exactly. Like, oh. Yeah. yeah. So this they lost is... almost everything. They had to start exactly. over and over again. Exactly. And therefore, this for me means family business is not about ownership. It's about the mindset. Mm. It's a mindset of the family because they had to survive. They had to start over again and again and again. And this mm. is what they achieved today as a multi-generational, multinational uh, conglomerate uh, mm. with families living in different parts of the world, but all very close. But shared Both values, right? And what you shared said, values. Exactly. shared values, yeah. Exactly. And this is what I found so striking in our survey finding, right? So not only that, uh, that there is no ESG strategy in place, even worse, we see no increase of those family business owners and uh, re that say we have our values codified in writing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the time is over so that you can assume that your implicit values as an owning family are implicitly understood by all stakeholders and employees. You have to make it explicit and to have to align it with the business strategy. Otherwise, it will the, never understood. Invest and, in the formulation. I mean, that's fascinating. And just in this context, because we're just talking about HSA as a, as a Middle Eastern family, correct. we have a question from Mr. Lutfi Ashade here, who's asking. Hi, Peter, Lutfi. Great to see you here. Good yeah. To see you. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's like uh, a nice little coffee that Lutfi is invited to. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Lutfi is asking if it's covered, the survey has covered the MENA region. Absolutely. And whether, whether there has been a, a particular outlook in there being a, more like a, a faster adoption of ESG framework in the near future what's your view on that based on the data peter so uh, of course so we have covered uh, the uh, the mena region of course as well and uh, similar to uh, asia we have higher higher commitment to send uh, to sustainability in the mena region so uh, i believe this is deeply rooted and embedded in the middle eastern culture also mm -hmm. in the islamic culture as mm -hmm. a very caretaking element of uh, taking care of others yeah if you think mm -hmm. about concepts like sakat and others this is always about caretaking this is mm -hmm. sometimes very misunderstood in the western world mm -hmm. that uh, that uh, the islamic uh, finance is loving the islamic way of doing business it's a very sensitive one Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, not as profit oriented as in other, other parts of the world. Yes, uh, it is also on top of the agenda. Yes, also family business in Middle East are not where I want them to be to make that uh, a number one priority. But uh, they are uh, very good in understanding that it's uh, that uh, is a high, of high importance and they are slightly higher engaged in impact investing. Okay. And of course, also the con. I think that the the context, uh, countries' context, etc., proximity to uh, certain conflicts right. might heighten uh, this sense of urgency. Of course, that we feel in the Middle East, for instance. Uh, Lakshmi, thank you so much for giving the example of a family foundation in the Netherlands that has built a partnership with you. Uh, to uh, and so, thank you for that example. I encourage you to follow uh, this link as well. I think uh, for the. The, the 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 cases in the collection are very interesting because again like we have very contrasting regions we also so maybe uh, peter you've chosen the hsa group to start with and it's a strong strong values driven uh uh case how did the other how did the other family business story strike you that came from totally different sort of cultural backgrounds yeah so of course they are all great and i can only encourage everyone here participating today in this live stream to uh, spend time to read all through all the case study because every case study has something very special uh, and uh, something really inspiring uh, that you might be able to find adaptable to your personal situation or your business um so for me another one is a mexican example yeah with ido mm -hmm. Berde. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think this is a very interesting one um, because uh, they have turned the business 
uh, based on the strong belief that uh, it's uh, so, so it's better to work with the nature instead against the nature mm. so that it's better to reforest uh, the, the pine trees instead of uh, cutting them down so because mm. cutting them down is yeah. uh, of course a short-term profit but long-term nothing and the reforestation uh, is uh, for the long term and for the benefit. And um, I think uh, what I found so striking in this story is that uh, they have been so so passionate and so resilient and so mm. uh, so focused on making a difference. And they knew that yeah. they can't do it on their own as a family business. And this is why they they, they looked for ways how they can involve mm -hmm. uh, farmers into the ideas, how to encourage them to onboard the journey. And the financial situation often didn't allow them to do so. And this is when they started with microfinancing, with zero interest lending. And uh, this has led uh, to a fantastic new ecosystem, mm -hmm. which is now today evolved from uh, first, uh, we help the farmers to change the business model for the better and for the long term to get them out of poverty and having good sustained income. Um, and uh, this has transformed into a crowdfunding platform, Kiva, today, which is self-sustaining as a platform from a financing perspective. And when it comes to their business model, right? So in this uh, in this uh, uh, specific uh, area that they're operating in, where it's uh, then I think with a uh, for those who didn't know that it's a pine resin industry. Pine resin right? industry, yes, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think this is important to mention. So this is what I found so striking is that they started with this with this dashboard. Mm -hmm. yeah, so they have uh, a reporting course, is very important to them. In, uh, measuring the impact, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. twenty KPIs, and they have also formulated so so uh, what they want to achieve, not only for their for the business, also how they benefit uh, employment, how women are benefiting uh, from this, how the landowners are doing, how mm -hmm. people generate long-term good profitable income it's all part of the 20k uh, measures and it's transparent it's mm -hmm. fully transparent and open and this even if many family business try to be as intransparent as possible and they really uh, uh, turned it around they flipped it around they just in this regard we want to be as transparent as possible and we want to have a positive impact on as many uh, lives of farmers and uh, workers and individuals as possible. And they work also under very difficult political circumstances. Yes, absolutely. I was going to say, yes, absolutely. But also I think that the, the and I, I second your, your, your analysis of this entirely. And I would, I would emphasize here that when you talk to them, there is this sense of a real focus on solving this one problem, which fits circular, of course, into the, uh, the family business that is called Pinosa Group, which is the largest uh, pine raisin, uh, you know, a processor in, in Mexico. It, there's, a, there's a beautiful circularity of it and like sort of like a very clear, we have created, um, we have we have damaged and so we have to repair. But I think what we've also learned from 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 Sean Paul and, 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 and Fredo mm -hmm. King here is the fact how closely linked um, environmental impact to social impact is. So how the reforestation project has had an even bigger social impact probably than it has an environmental impact because reforestation takes a long time to environmentally be of benefit and it has a social impact almost much earlier even than it has an even environmental uh, uh, change, a uh, visible change. So I thought that was absolutely fa fascinating in this particular case as well, to understand the connection between the E, the S and the G, right? Like it's not to just look at these things as uh, separate goals. It comes goals. all together. Exactly. Uh, so exactly. it comes all together. And this uh, this case study reminds me on Berry Kallebau, they have a similar initiative with uh, Forever Chocolate and so on. So they are not the only one, but I think they're doing it in, in a very transparent and uh, and very honest way and therefore i can only encourage you to have a look at the tarawat story and to go on the website to have a look at the dashboard i find it it's very inspirational absolutely so the trick is to measure the right things mm -hmm. 
right? And, uh, yeah. I think <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna take some. I'm gonna take some questions first before we get to the next stage here because we have mm -hmm. a, another few cases we want to have a look at. So uh, uh, Bob Cody, hi uh, Bob, nice to have you here with us today. Um, you're, he's asking Peter for traditional founders who are being influenced by the next gen to pursue ESG. What's a good starting point? Low hanging fruits or quick wins to get the ball rolling? If you like, Peter, we can keep that question of uh, of Bob's till the end. I think that was anyway something we wanted to maybe ask uh, towards That's the end. Like. Um, I think that maybe we'll just quickly take Kim's question. Hey, Kim, uh, nice to have you with us. Um, did you study how control and the loss of it affects owner families' willingness to embrace uh, or a tendency to resist sustainability commitments? And this is actually the second question that we have here in the chat that asks the relationship between generational uh, alignment to uh, whether it influences the effectiveness or the reality of an ESG strategy. So are we looking at a next generation that's super willing and an incumbent generation that is not so willing and that that's why we have the outcome that we see in the survey? What do you think, Peter? Absolutely. So uh, if we compare this with the results of our uh, next gen survey, so that we also do it, so a family business and next gen survey taking turns every year, just uh, to clarify uh, that we know that uh, the new generation, the next gen, has a different perspective of uh, different things. It's about governance, clear roles and responsibilities, it's about digitization, new business model, and of course, ESG. And they understood that uh, profit and purpose has to go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. There is no one thing without the other. Uh, but uh, this uh, is not uh, fully embraced by the incumbent generation uh, to turn this discussion uh, into a business priority. Mm -hmm. And this is mm -hmm. very sad that this is the case. Yes, there's still a generational gap to close. And the fact that the incumbent generation is getting has a longer life expectation and the younger generation well educated studied abroad coming with a different mindset are entering the boardroom the shareholder circle or yeah. even the business so there is pressure coming but uh, there are a couple of gaps in generational transition the generational gap is one of those and this is uh, one of the reasons uh, absolutely why uh, they are still falling short uh, making ESG a business priority. And I think one of the cases in the collection that actually managed to transform the business is uh, actually the case of State Garden. So the, the, the produce business, a, a huge, uh, like now over 900 employees, a very, a very huge distribution network in the US. It's the De Michaelis family. And we spoke to Mark De Michaelis, the CEO of State Garden, who is him and his two brothers, which, by the way, nice little detail, they all operate from the same office together. Uh, as a second generation, the three brothers are in the same office every day, which is an interesting, um, you know, maybe maybe uh, adds to the success that they're having in transformative strategies, because what have they done? They've pivoted entirely towards organic, convinced even their providers to shift to organic. Uh, and that is a, is a huge achievement. So transformative indeed. A quote from Mark, we're probably selling the healthiest thing you can sell and farming it in probably the most responsible way. And if you can do that and make money on top of it, that's a win, win, win. And I thought that was such a beautiful way of summarizing how the family does not need to necessarily feel like it's sacrificing any economic uh, benefit by looking at, like, you know, by setting a, an ambitious ESG agenda, just like State Garden has done in, in, such a, in such a wonderful way. What did you think of this case, Peter? Like, what struck you about State Garden? I think, uh, uh, so it's another fantastic case, which is related to the consumer uh, market industry directly. So uh, uh, what... What struck me most about this case is the confidence mm. of the owners, because they have the confidence of doing the right thing, mm. building trust by doing the right thing, mm -hmm. by trying to sell the healthiest food, the healthiest product as they possibly could, mm. that this will pay and show results and pay back in the long term. Mm. Not everyone would have had this trust that everything uh will go so well uh but they did and they did never compromise yeah. and i think this is another example like hsa that the belief 
And what we do is the right thing to do. And yep. we do it for a purpose. We don't do it for profit. We do it for a purpose mm -hmm. that this is deeply rooted in the DNA and the core values of the family. And without this trust and confidence, you could easily have uh, followed a different path of short-term profitability, short-term profit, yeah. and so on. And I think this is, from my point of view, probably uh, probably the most tr striking finding. Not that they're in the organic food business, so many are in the organic food business, but they started to become a relevant player in the organic food business Absolutely. when this was not even close to being uh, to being um, so smart and, uh, and, and, so and when the sacrifices had to be made, right? Like as a pioneering, Absolutely. as a trailblazer, really. And also thank you, Pramodita, for, for sharing the link to the sustainability forums that you're holding. The, the Michaelis case is actually also documented very well in, in her recent book and very interesting case study to read. Uh, absolutely encourage everyone to, to check that out. Um, before we sort of like close off here, uh, Peter, I, like we, we have to, we, we promise also to get back to uh, a question of Bob's here mm -hmm. that sort of like ties up what everyone else wants to know. Touching upon the two other cases that we had in the collection, which were also interesting because we interviewed uh, first and second generation uh, family businesses. One was Numi Organic Tea, founded by brother and sister entrepreneurial team, uh, Ahmed and Reem in the US, uh, Iraqi uh, diaspora, beautiful case study of how to penetrate a well-established industry with a totally new brand and with a very, very sustainable approach. The second one is Nature's Legacy from the Philippines, a husband and wife team who built an incredible ecosystem for their employees around their sustainable materials-based furniture brand and it's just a wonderful story uh, quick quotes here from ahmed from numi t that sustainable and environmental and social commitment that we had from day one really exuded a culture that was about being a servant to one another and caring for what we put out in the world i think he said that absolutely beautifully and echoing that on the other side of the world is uh, kathy delantar from nature's legacy who says we started with material first, which is their business. Second is the design innovation, then third to function. That's on the commercial side. On the other side, our focus is human development. And, and I think these two cases exemplify also, of course, the potential and the constant potential of families starting new ventures and new businesses and investing in ventures that from the outset have a sustainability focus and have like an ESG agenda that's built into the product, built into the service. What have you seen in terms of like uh, those kinds of developments of also established families, Peter, investing into new spin-off businesses, investing into next-gen businesses that allow them to implement that ESG vision? What do you what do you think of that strategy? I think it's a good strategy, especially for those uh, who are uncertain whether they can transform the core business uh, in in one go. And um, I know many families around the world uh, that started uh, with the family venturing, and some did it in the past to ex to diversify and find mm -hmm. the new cash cows of tomorrow. And the purpose has simply changed here. Uh, today, it's, uh, it's the purpose of uh, how can we uh, contribute to an SDG? How mm. can we solve an important uh, issue on the planet? And by doing so, surprise, surprise, this attracts followers and will become uh, eventually profitable. Mm. But the starting point is a different one. And, uh, you know, Moulier family in France, or they have yeah. always fostered this entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, so um, there are other families in the Middle East yeah, uh, uh, who have started um, very early to foster the innovative and entrepreneurial culture to encourage the next generation to set up new business like Al Zayani in Bahrain, for instance, and others, yeah. right? And say, mm. this is a role of the next generation, not running the day-to-day -day business. So I remember uh, the leader of the family, uh, Khalid Al Zayani, once told me it's a waste of talent that the uh, new generation should run the daily business so they should mm -hmm. pioneer new things so it's also an interesting perspective to look at but uh, today we see it more and more also in the matured european uh, uh, north american and asian market 
that the next generation wants to prove themselves, wants to pioneer new things, and family venturing is a good way of doing so. And and to to feed into and also to answer Bob's question and maybe tying that in with Ludwig's uh, second question here that we have in the stream. Thank you guys so much for engaging. Um, the question of how to bring this conversation to the table, so whether it's investing into something new or transforming the legacy that's there, how to bring that to the table, what are your tips for the next generation, Peter? And secondly, I think an interesting question from Lutfi is like, who should be in charge of the ESG agenda in the family business? So who, who does it, who should it fall to uh, to drive this forward? What do you, What are your recommendations for a future outlook here? Yeah, so uh, two good good questions, Ludwig. Um, let me start with the second one. I think it's something that should be at the core vested interest of all owners. So mm -hmm. if there's a family council, the family council should take control over the family values, which ultimately mm -hmm. needs to be transformed and translated in a family mission statement. And this has to be aligned with what the business is doing, which led ultimately automatically to ESG commitment and goals with a focus on those SDGs relevant for your business, on those SDGs that you can really influence. I think this is one thing. So for me, it's uh, it's one of the top, top tasks for the family council or for the owners. Mm -hmm. Executed through the board of directors and ultimately through the executive team, but it is in their vested interest as a long-term generational owner who set the core values and the rules, this is where it should stand. So how difficult is it? So um, yes, of course, it's always difficult to change uh, uh, a winning system. Uh, but look what's currently happening. So if you don't have clear ESG goals and target in place, you don't have access for capital intense uh, industries like shipping industries, you don't have, have access to proper ship finance anymore. Yeah, if you come up with an old vessel with a highly polluting uh, vessel, you don't get mm. fun funding for your vessel. Yeah, so it has an impact on the company evaluation. Yeah, if you are listed or not, so it has an impact on supply chain. Right, come uh, customers asking already for that. So the question is whether the family business wants to lead the trend or want mm. to become a late follower. And this is to my earlier statement: the time to act is now because family business has the trust advantage. According to Edelman Trust Barometer, they are still the most trusted form of organization on the planet. But currently the big corporates, the black stones, the black rod of the world, making ESG a number one priorities mm -hmm. and family business are lacking behind because they still believe it's not worth to make it explicit because it's already part of our DNA. Yes. Even if this is true, and I strongly believe this is true. You have to communicate. You have to prove yourself, as we saw in the case studies. You have to hold yourself accountable against, yes. against certain goals and targets, and you have to prove it so that it's not only lip service, so that people should trust you by what you are saying, but that people trust you by what you are doing. And currently, they're running behind, and this is the license to operate, the trust of society, the trust of your employees and so on. And for me, um, it's a very critical time for a family business. If mm -hmm. they they miss the, the trick to make it a business priority, to defend the trust ad advantage that they currently have, this will have a massive impact, not only on the ability to attract and retain talent. Why should governments gives them then still an advantage for generational tradition yeah. when it comes to estate and inheritance taxes or other taxation. And we see that in Europe and other countries uh, currently already, that because of the big and increasing wealth inequality on the planet, billionaires are bigger, becoming bigger, every 17 mm. hours a new billionaire on the planet, and at the same time poverty uh, is getting bigger and bigger. So we have already the discussion, tax them higher. And we know that for the responsible family business owners, that all money is invested in creating jobs and doing good for the planet. But this is an assumption and you have to make it explicit. And this is why it's so important uh, to codify your core family values and make ESG a business priority and report and becoming transparent in, uh, in terms of KPIs and how you're really doing. Otherwise, 
we'll see very, very difficult and tough times for family businesses to come. Beautiful advice from Peter English here. A codify it, make it explicit, and turn it into a competitive advantage for many generations to come. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for joining us on Third World Magazine Live and discussing both the PwC Global Survey and the family business I could continue discussing and chatting with you Me on too. this topic. It's so great. So, and thanks it's for all really the great, great. questions. We'll do, we'll do, another, we'll do one again. So, um, so let's do another one here. soon. And uh, so, thanks a lot for having me here today and uh, um, for all uh, the people out there uh, listening to you today. I hope you find some inspiration and some also tangible uh, uh, inspiration and some good recommendations so that. Uh, the session today was of good value for you. Thank you, uh, Ramya, for having me. And thanks uh, to everyone out there for listening. Pleasure. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for all the participants. This video will be available on our website and continues to be available on all the platforms where it's been streamed. And we're looking forward to our next Star of Magazine live session where we hope you will all join us. Thank you. Bye.